have a number of electrons and protons in your nucleus. It's newly charged with atom. Ion is its name. Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about what kind of compounds and elements can be found in different spheres. So for example, the atmosphere, the biosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. Well, in doing this video, I'll cover the next top point, which is all about how we can actually separate mixtures to bring them back into their original compounds or elements. So this, the actual dot point says, identify and describe procedures that can be used to separate natural occurring mixtures. So they identify and describe the actual verbs. Identify just means we have to name, and describe means we have to actually give a bit more detail. So we have to identify and describe the procedures used to separate mixtures. And I'll go over again and quickly what mixtures were. Mixtures were just, for example, if we have compounds, which were things which were bonded together, and elements, if we have both of these in a given area, compounds and elements, or compounds or elements, but more than just one. If we have them all in one area, that's a mixture. And remember, mixtures can be separated either for physical means or through chemical means. And in this video, we're going to cover mostly the physical ways of separating mixtures. So you can imagine here, this is just two pictures, just to give you a quick overview of what I exactly mean when it comes to separating mixtures. So this is a mixture between noodles or spaghetti and water. And so we have noodles and water. And what happens if you want to say, okay, we just want to get the just the noodles. What do we do? Well, we can use a sieve because when it comes to noodles, they're obviously a lot, big, a lot bigger than the water molecules. So we just have to use a sieve and that separates noodles from the water. So the property that we use when it comes to a sieve is the fact that the solid, which is noodle, is larger than the water molecules. So only the water molecules will pass through the sieve, whereas the spaghettis get stuck and we can separate them that way. Right? So this was just an example, but I'll go over different ways we can separate different substances. So the first one I'll talk about is separating solids from solids. So, but then the property that we're going to use is that some of the solids might be smaller. So size of solids will be the property that distinguishes the difference between the two. An example I give is rocks. So if, for example, we, we are at the beach, we've got lots of rocks and lots of sand, what we can do is we can use a sieve, which was this here, and we can use that sieve to separate the rocks from the sand. And the reason why is because it's the rocks were large or larger than the sand, and the sand was generally finer and smaller. So by using this sieve, you could make sure that the sand drops through and only the rocks stay behind. So here we've separated a mixture of rocks and sand. What I'm going to talk about next is how we can separate solids from liquids. And what we do here is, again, the property that we're going to use, so how we can make that happen, is the fact that generally the size is again different. So the solids are larger than the liquids. And what we're going to use here, so the actual procedure, we call filtration. So beforehand I was just using a sieve. So sieving, this is filtration. And how filtration works is we've got a filter paper, which is this here. This is our filter paper. We're going to put something inside, which has both a solid and a liquid. So the example I give here is mud, because mud is mostly sand and water. So what's going to happen is the water component, so I'll draw the water component in blue, will pass through and become the filtrate. Filtrate is a word for the actual water component that doesn't get left in the actual filter paper. And the thing that gets stuck is the sand. So the things that get spilled up is the sand. And the reason why is because obviously sand particles are a lot bigger and they can't fit through that very fine filter paper, whereas water, water particles can pass through. So that's how we can separate, for example, a sand from water, so a solid from liquid. And that's for filtration. So at the moment, we've gone for sieving and filtration. Now I'm going to cover how we can separate dissolved solids from liquids. What I mean by that is, I mean, for example, if we have salt solution, so salt solution here, Salt solution is if we have in water, we've got lots of small particles of salt. So here I'll just draw a big batch of water. See, so all of these are water molecules, lots of them close by. And in between is 
water molecules, we've got tiny salt particles, sodium chloride mixed around. Now the problem is they're actually so small that we can't use sieving or filtration because these both these rely on the size difference between what we're trying to separate from each other. Whereas with, when it comes to salt solution, both the water particles and the salt particles that are dissolved are so small that we can't use filtration or sieving. We have to use something else. So we're going to use we're going to use evaporation. So this procedure is called evaporation. And what we do here, and the actual property that we rely on, the property when it comes to filtration, is a difference in boiling point. Difference in boiling point. Because what happens if we actually put a flame on? So we're going to put a flame on and actually boil that. What's going to happen? Because, oops, because the actual water has a higher or lower melting point and boiling point than salt. You can have your water evaporating, so water will leave. And what's left behind is the thing that has low melting boiling point, which is the salt. So after a while, all the water is gone, and we've just got salt left over. So now we've separated a dissolved solid, such as salt, from our liquid, from water. And the procedure was called evaporation. Now we're separating liquids from liquids. We can, and these are the mis I'm just first going to talk about the miscible liquids. Miscible means that we can mix it. So mix it. The procedure. So it says identify. I'm first. I'm identify the procedure. It's called distillation. And after identifying it, I will describe it. So distillation works by having two liquids which are mixed together. So here we've mixed ethanol and water, and we're trying to separate ethanol from water. And we use the property, again, is difference in boiling point. So the property is difference in boiling point. Now, here we have water. We can imagine here to have, we have ethanol plus water in this beaker here. And we're going to apply heat, so we're going to heat the actual source. What's going to happen, because one has a boiling point of 78, so BP of 78, that's ethanol, and the other one has a boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. What's going to happen if we increase the temperature to, let's say, about 80 degrees Celsius? So this flame makes 80 degrees Celsius. What's going to happen is ethanol will evaporate. So ethanol will leave, so I'm going to draw the light blue for ethanol. Ethanol will leave, go down in a tube, and become liquid here. So the, most of this now is ethanol, whereas most of the water, not all of the, most of the water will stay because it has a higher boiling point. We only have 80 degrees Celsius here, whereas the boiling point of water is 100 degrees. So most of the leftover will be water. So now we've separated water from ethanol using distillation. That was how distillation works. And I will talk about fractional distillation, not in this video, but in a future video. But that's just, if we use fractional distillation, if those boiling points were a lot closer, so for example, if you're trying to separate something from water from 100 degrees from something else that has 97 degrees, because then it's going to be a lot harder to use the distillation, so we use fractional distillation instead. But I'll go over that in a different video. And then we have, if so this was the separating immiscible liquids, but now we're going to separate immiscible liquids. And what that means, immiscible means we can't mix. So can't mix. And what we do here is we grab, so for example, you can pretend this here is oil, and this here is water. And obviously, oil and water don't mix. So these are immiscible. So these don't mix. Now, what can we do if we want to separate oil from water? We can use a separating funnel. And this is what that device is called. So again, I've identified the procedure. It's called a separating funnel. And you might have used this already in a lab. It's just one of those beakers that has a tap. So this is the tap here. And what we can do is we can just open that tap and let the stuff flow through. And because water and oil are obviously not mixing, we can just let all the water pass. We can let the water flow down. And then once we get to the oil part, the oil layer, we just close the tap and then oil is stuck. So now we've separated water from oil. So that's how we can separate a immiscible liquid, such as oil, from, from oil from water, because these don't mix. And if we have, if we want to separate a soluble solid from an insoluble solid, 
we can use some a combination. So what we can use, we can use the fact that they, so what I'll show you, this is what I'll, I'll just show you what I do. This is salt and sand. Salt is obviously soluble. What happens if you put salt in water? It dissolves. So salt is soluble, whereas sand does not, is insoluble. Let's say you wanted to eat something with salt and by mistake you put that salt into a into sand at the beach. Obviously a very unlikely scenario, but let's assume that happened. If you want to get that salt back, what you could do is you could grab that salt and the sand mixture. You would grab it and then you would put it into water. And the reason why that would work is because your salt is going to actually dissolve in the actual water and your mud won't dissolve. So now I've used filter paper that we did earlier, so that was this part here, the filtration. You could actually filter out all the sand and you have leftover salt and water solution. And if we were then to use evaporation, you would then get back to just having your salt. So in this case, if we have this kind of scenario where you have a soluble solid and you want to separate that from insoluble solid, we would have to use two different mechanisms. We use first the idea of filtration because we've put our insoluble and soluble solids into water and soluble solid has dissolved and we can then filter out the insoluble solid. And then we have to use evaporation to get rid of the water to just have our salt left. Right? But these were some of the mechanisms that we could use. So I'll quickly cover them again. We could use sieving and the property that we use here is that the size is different for the two different solids we were trying to get rid of so rocks from sand we could use filtration the property here that we're using is again the size so we can filter out sand from water because water particles are a lot smaller and they won't be able to fit through the squeeze through the actual filter paper the sand particles and we could use evaporation this happens if we have a dissolved solid and a liquid such as salt from water. So if you have salt solution, salt water, we could use evaporation. We could use fractional distillation. If you have two liquids which are mixable, such as ethanol and water, if they're mixed together, we could use distillation to get rid of ethanol and just have water by itself. We could use a separating funnel if we have two immiscible liquids. And that works but because we can just put the tap on, wait for the water to go down, and then once it's all gone, we close the tap and we have left or left over. And then if we have a, want to separate a soluble solid, such as salt, from insoluble solids, such as sand, we could use both filtration and evaporation to separate salt from sand. But I hope that was useful. Thank you for watching.